Sabrina, I just have to call you out because I haven't seen you since your extraordinary pool reports. Sabrina, as we, we know, was the only person traveling, the only journalist. Uh, there was a photojournalist and you on that small plane, secretly flying with the president into Kyiv, and all of your reporting was just amazing. We all relied on it, and they were brilliant reports. So yeah, thank, thank you, you so for much, that. Andrea. Thank you. So I wanted to ask you about the the role of Crimea, and Zelensky saying, you know, again, that they have ambitions for that. This is a negotiating position, perhaps, because it's just untenable if it is a, a Russian-speaking, Russian-populated place that Vladimir Putin is determined to hold. Yes, and I think that that really gets to uh, the heart of why it's going to be so difficult to see any kind of negotiated settlement here. Um, you know, both sides are preparing for a major springtime offensive. There's still a hope among some leaders in Europe. You've certainly seen uh, French President Emmanuel Macron and German Chancellor Scholz call for some kind of negotiated settlement. Uh, but it's just not clear what the end game looks like. And we see that Vladimir Putin is showing no signs of relenting in this war of conquest. So, you know, the big question now, after this historic visit that President Biden made to Kyiv, to the capital city, is where do we go from here beyond just providing arms, ammunition and assistance to the Ukrainians? Uh, what is the way out? And do we, you know, the war is now entering its second year. How do you kind of keep public support for continuing to provide that assistance? And what is really going to change the landscape on the battlefield? So I think those are some of the key questions moving forward. And as you point out, when you look at, you know, President Zelensky and what his, uh, you know, his hope is, it's just really unclear that you could see any kind of negotiated settlement moving forward. And, and you know, certainly in the desire for everyone is not to prolong this war any further and to kind of see what the end game really looks like. And Kevin, you were in Munich as well. Um, where do you come down on all of the um, the attempts to deter China from jumping into the middle of this with weapons, potentially? Uh, Secretary Blinken saying that he, they are seriously considering it and warning them against doing it. You were there in Munich. Uh, Vice President Harris saying that as well to me. Um, you saw all of the comments, Jake Sullivan, after with that. Um, is this just a bluff? Well, I think it's important to, to give credit to the administration for doing, uh, Sabrina and I were talking earlier, of what they've done the whole war, which is to come out with the intelligence early and often and to say, we, we see you. We see that you're trying to do this. We see you're talking about it and, and don't. So that's, you know, don't take that for granted that the United States is putting out intelligence to, to, to let the Chinese know that we're watching them. I think it's an awful long way off. I'd listen to what, you know, CI Director Burns said. Um, I think if I could say to the Crimea question, though, it was, it was really fascinating to, to see Kier show the geography of what, of, of what Crimea is like and what it would really take, because it's so different than the rest of the war that we've seen. And Defense One is reporter on this in the fall about what would it really take for the Ukrainians to actually take Crimea if they have to. And it's not that land bridge or the, or the, the other bridge that he was pointing to. It's the water. It's a full-scale something, in amphibious invasion with paratroopers flying in. It is a full-scale Normandy-looking invasion that the Ukrainians just don't have the forces or the training or the experience to, to do. So short of that, you know, the Crimea question is probably the, the tenth question down the line of how do you stop the fighting? How do you stop the war? And if, are the Ukrainians willing to entertain that fact before the Russians are? Uh, when right now we're, we're not even at Crimea, we're at the river still. We're still the, na the neighbor, you know, deciding or, or people, someone's going to have to decide whether it, the Ukrainians are going to be given the, the, the equipment to fight for any more territory, much less for Crimea. So does it get down to the fact that there's going to have to be some sort of a NATO security umbrella, perhaps what has been proposed by Germany and France in broad terms this week, because they're going to have to agree that Putin keeps right. Crimea, and no one wants to say this, but that Zelensky doesn't get it back because it's so hard to gain and then to hold. Yeah, some kind of, of you know, of international security force. I mean, there are ambassadors pitching this in the early days, you know, thinking it could be under the UN, it could be under NATO, it could be under any, any auspices. But doing so as, you know, it enters into the scenario that NATO has been trying to avoid the entire time, which is, you know, being the opposing force directly to the Russians. And so if NATO is providing a security guarantee, it's everything short of Article 5, really. Uh, if what happens if the Russians launch a missile or something goes wrong that puts them in direct conflict with each other and suddenly there are security guarantees that have to be honored and fulfilled? 
then you have dragged Eastern European countries and the rest of NATO into a direct war with Russia that we're not at yet. And Tony Blinken keeps saying, Sabrina, a durable peace. Yes, and I think the Biden administration has been very reluctant to spell out in more detail what security guarantees for Ukraine would look like, in part because of the very important uh, point that Kevin raises, where they're willing to continue and provide arms and ammunition to the Ukrainians and perhaps come to some kind of international agreement on what that assistance looks like. But they want to stop short of anything that would trigger, trigger Article 5 and necessitate more involvement uh, in this war, more direct involvement by the U.S. and its allies. Well, it's great to see you, Sabrina, and Kevin as well. Kevin Barron of Defense One. Thank you.